Right, welcome back. Thanks very much, everyone, and welcome back to this introduction to Streams 1 and 2. And I just wanted to say, to start with, how brilliant and slightly terrifying it is to actually be speaking to a room full of people <laughs> and not, not a screen full of black squares with people's names on, um, wondering whether they've nipped out to use the loo and are wondering whether they remember to put mute on before they they left. Um, so it's brilliant to see you all, or at least the top half of your faces anyway. Um, we've been playing the game of trying to guess who's who, um, and I think we missed a trick with not getting masks with people's names printed on them instead of name <laughs> badges. I think that would have been really helpful. But anyway, it's great to see you all. Um, this session is, um, has been set up as an introduction to some of the, the sessions that will follow um, for the rest of the conference. So. Um, the idea of how the running this conference um, with, with two, two sort of linked streams um, came about because when we put out the call for sessions and the theme of the conference, we got um, a lot of session, excellent session proposals, but that were very similar and complementary. And I think that, that, I mean, that was a good thing. Um, and it picks up on, I think, what Kate was saying earlier about the fact that the sector is moving in a different direction and people are thinking about uh, value and about the, the benefit of what they do and what we do as a profession um, more broadly. So how and how that value is um, created and how it's how it's communicated. Um, so we decided that rather than rejecting sessions and saying, well, we want this one and we don't want that one, we'd try and invite session organisers to come together. Um, and, and to, to work more collaboratively to present their ideas. And the two streams have gone in slightly different directions. So stream one um, has developed, morphed into a series of many, four mini sessions, um, probably a little bit more on, along traditional lines. I think stream two has, set it, has, has manifested itself slightly differently, but um, I'll leave Emily to, to introduce that. Um, and actually, at that point, it's probably a good, a good moment to introduce um, my fellow speakers. I didn't introduce myself, but um, you probably um, are bored of hearing me rabbit on about stuff anyway. Um, but I have also on the platform um, Emily Plunkett from HS2 and Claire Corkhill from CBA, um, who've been instrumental in putting, putting these, these streams together. Um, so for stream one, um, what we're thinking about is how we integrate public benefit, social value, um, and sustainable development goals. And we use a lot of these terms like public, public value, social value, public benefit, interchangeably and sometimes not very precisely. And I'm not entirely sure whether that matters or not. You might want to have a view on that. But I think it's probably important that we do know what we mean by those terms and, and we can articulate them clearly, particularly when we're communicating outside our sector. And again, um, picking up, I'm going to end up picking up on an awful lot of what Kate said um, in the opening address, which again, I think is a good thing. It's slightly difficult to follow that, that presentation because Kate said it so much better than, than I will, but at least we're all on the same page. Um, and I'm not, I wasn't sitting there at the front thinking, oh, crikey, I'm going to have to rewrite um, everything that we've, that we've put together for these, these sessions. Um, and what I wanted to just, just emphasize at the beginning was was we use these terms and we think we know what we mean by them. I've got my own views and other people will have different views. But it is important to make sure that we align our communication with the priorities and the objectives of the clients and the funders and, and the government, um, the decision makers, so that we can show how archaeology can help to develop their outcomes and their objectives and look beyond our sector and not just, just inwards. Um, and with that in mind, um, th that importance of thinking about the value that any piece of archaeological work will deliver right at the very outset, to make that the initial consideration so that that can be articulated clearly in project designs and written schemes of investigation and research proposals. And thinking about how we communicate that value and the public benefit and the different social value outcomes and the um, manifestations of, of, of benefit um, that, that we'll inevitably talk about over, over the course of the, uh, of, of the, the, the next two days. Um, I don't want that to belittle the value of knowledge creation 
because that's fundamentally at the heart of, of what we do. But really to encourage you, as, as I'm sure you already do, to think about what that knowledge is for. So we're not just creating knowledge for its own sake to exist in, 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 in repositories um, with some theoretical view that it will be accessible in the future. We're actually thinking about how that knowledge contributes to the discussions and the debates that are important outside our sector as well as within it. And climate change is the key example there. Um, but there are wider discussions about, about what it means to be um, to exist in society and what it means to be human that, that we, we can and, and should be contributing to. So just to very briefly have a look at the sessions that we've got coming up in Stream 1, tomorrow morning we'll be looking at two different ways of talking about value. We'll be looking at public value frameworks and our colleagues from Historic England will be talking us through their approach to public value frameworks and we'll also be looking at sustainable development goals. Um, in the afternoon, we'll be looking at some particular examples and sp specific examples of how value is delivered, the contribution that heritage makes to regeneration and the role of community engagement in delivering public benefit. At the risk of, again, repeating um, what you've, some of what you've just heard, um, I did want to highlight where else we're talking about value, um, the value of archaeology, and um, particularly within the construction sector. Um, hopefully you've come across the, the revised Syria Guide to Archaeology and, good, and Construction Good Practice. Um, that was a collaborative piece of work with MOLA and with Tarry Nixon Heritage Works that we were involved in. And we've done quite a lot of promotion around that. But we want to do more promotion, um, particularly within our own sector, so that we can make sure that, that, that our communication is aligned um, to, to the messages that we're giving to our clients and, and to the construction sector. Um, CIFA's client guide amplifies that message to clients more generally um, in a wide variety of different, different um, contexts, not just construction, um, and through the professional practice paper that, um, that Kate mentioned, which was an, another piece of collaborative work that we worked with um, colleagues at HS2 and with Sadie Watson um, of MOLA on that. And again, these are publications that are focused on how archaeology can contribute to wider outcomes um, and objectives, and, and particularly to add value to clients' projects, so expressing that value in terms that will make sense to them and aren't necessarily you know, the sort of technical archaeological language that we might use um, in, our own, in our own communities. The value of archaeology is highlighted within many of our inward-facing, sector-facing um, documents as well, and I, I wanted to just highlight two of them. Um, Scotland's archaeology strategy is more than halfway through its 10-year delivery plan. Um, the strategy emphasises the contribution that archaeology makes to Scotland and to life in Scotland and what it means to be Scottish in the 21st century. It addresses some, some big themes, but with some quite specific delivery actions. So it's, it's managed to... Um, negotiate that, that journey from high level objectives and, and addressing those big questions to, to what we can actually do in practice to, to make a difference. Um, the other document that I wanted to, um, to, to mention was, was the um, Archaeology 2030, the strategic approach uh, for Northern Ireland, which again addresses some of those big questions and emphasises the, the, the sort of the the living nature of archaeology, I suppose, and the living contribution that it, it makes in discussions about sustainability and climate change and the contribution that it makes to well-being and questions of identity. Um, we seem to be lacking an archaeological strategy for England um, in quite the same way, so um, I can't show you that. But um, these issues are touched on in the 21st century challenges for archaeology work that CIFA is undertaking with, um, with Historic England as well. And if we frame these messages in the right language, um, we're pushing at an open door. The, however cynical we might feel about, about the, the, the government agenda and, and government messages, that the government's construction playbook and the Construction Innovation Hub's value toolkit provide us 
or certainly provide archaeologists working as part of the construction process, a structure to frame a very different sort of value proposition from the old archaeological decontamination messages focused on removing a problem quickly and cheaply, which thankfully are being consigned to the history books increasingly now. Um, and just, I don't know how well this reproduces, I'm afraid. It's a, it's a, a bit of a screen grab from, from the, the uh, um, Value Toolkit website. Um, but particularly looking at where archaeology contributes to um, the ideas of human capital and social capital, um, where we can build those connections with communities, um, where we can f archaeologists can facilitate that input from communities who are affected by development, potentially positively, potentially negatively, and actually engage them in, in that process. And also in terms of delivering outcomes like uh, around skills, education and employment, um, knowledge, health and well-being that um, most large-scale construction projects will have, um, have targets to deliver. There remains a challenge around how we include more diverse voices in this conversation, and we've touched on that in other sessions um, in the online section of the, uh, of the conference so far, and I've no doubt that we'll, remain, that we'll return to those questions um, over the next three days. How we include those voices in the process of archaeology, and not just in answering the questions that we answer as archaeologists, but actually in formulating them in the first place. Um, and that is probably a good point to pause and hand over to Claire um, to introduce uh, some videos that she and, and Sadie um, have been working on. Claire, over to you. And keep your fingers crossed for the technology, please. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. Um, so I'm going to keep this fairly short and sweet, um, and I'm going to hopefully let the, the videos speak for themselves in a, in a moment. Um, but as Kate says, I've been working with Sadie Watson at MOLA to bring together a series of um, short films um, investigating the value of archaeology. Um, so Sadie and I really wanted to bring together a collection of videos that um, are voices that aren't often heard at conferences, um, although actually we are going to expand this and we're going to continue to add those stories and those voices to um, the CBA and the MOLA YouTube channels after the conference. So this is the introduction. Um, keep watching on those channels after the conference um, to see kind of additional um, voices um, as we add them over the next couple of weeks. So we really wanted to ask colleagues um, about their encounters with archaeology and where they think the, the value lies for them and for others. Um, and we wanted to think about um, how we can ensure, ensure their views are reflected in our work. So really, we wanted to use this as an opportunity to remind ourselves to um, both ask those questions in the first place, but also to stop and listen to them, uh, to hear those responses and to think about what they tell us about how we're doing our work at the moment and how we might potentially want to think about how we do our work in the future. Um, so we have five films here. They're all um, very short, um, two to three minutes long. And these collection of films focus on the voices of young people and developers. Uh, so I hope you enjoy them. I just, before I, I hit play, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of the people that have contributed um, to the films you'll see now and the films that are to come. Um, and fingers crossed, technology will work and uh, we will be able to watch them. Hi, my name is Michelle Baker. I'm a Social Value Associate Director at Atkins. Um, I first came across archaeology when I worked for a construction management team and I was working on a, a big development in London and we had uh, the Museum of London Archaeology on the project and we found some incredible Roman soldiers and horses and shoes um, on that site which was really exciting for the team. Um, and yeah, it was just, yeah, I was, I was fascinated with, with the finds that were there. And I believe the sort of main 
values or benefits of having archaeology um, in a construction project is that it can, you know, if you if you do early engagement with the community, it can really bring the community along with you on that on that journey. It can help the client, um, you know, get through some of the planning permissions because, you know, if you have your community on board and and working with you, then it's going to be, um, you know, less troublesome than trying to to work against your community. So I, again, I think the community benefits are that. You know they can have real ownership to to any findings um, within the the archaeology and on the site. And um, who doesn't who doesn't like to to dis discover something exciting and old oldie worldie? Um, and yeah, like some of the projects I've worked on, um, we've we've discovered things quite late into the construction period, and and the community hasn't been brought on. And I think that's actually a disbenefit for for that project. Whereas other big infrastructure, a road scheme infrastructure project that I worked on recently, um, you know, they're very, very proactive and they've engaged um, all the stakeholders um, from statutory organisations to local communities to be able to sort of get on board and and create a partnership really so that any findings that do, do happen that the local community are really involved in that. So, Um, I think for the future, obviously working somewhere like Atkins, we're an we're a infrastructure and design um, organisation across across the world. So, um, you know, we have lots of archaeology in this country here in the UK, and I don't think there won't be any big infrastructure project that I might work on that wouldn't have an archaeological aspect to it. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's just a great a great angle for a project to engage with communities and to. You know, get the buy-in of stakeholders, and to leave leave a you know sometimes a really precious legacy for communities to to look after. And you know, imagine if you're a house builder or something like that, and you, you have a great discovery. I mean, what a brilliant story to engage your community and um, yeah, promote promote the area. You know, it could it could sort of um you know who, who was it uh, Charles? No, which which king did they find? Um, I'm gonna in the in the car park. Um, you know, you never know. You might find Henry VIII somewhere. So um. So that, that's, you know, that, that's just sort of, I suppose, the excitement of archaeology. So, thank you. My name's Sam Jarrett and I am the Head of Marketing and Communications for UNI. I came across archaeology for the first time last summer. 2021 on our site at the Liberty of Southwark, which is a stone's throw from Borough Market. I think in the early days of property development, um, there's a really long timeline before you're able to start meaningfully telling a story. Archaeology gives you that amazing early involvement with the community, which enables you to have access to this whole treasure trove of stories. You never know what you're going to find and that really is quite exciting and if you find something meaningful then you're onto a winner like we did at the Liberty of Southwark. We were really lucky because we, we worked with Mola on, on a, an event where we were able to invite the local community in and they got to see the Roman mosaic firsthand which was a great experience and something that was was quite a, a sort of luxury thing to do because we weren't able to do that with everybody in London and they got a sneak peek before the rest of the world got to. Our work with MOLA has definitely shaped and uh, changed the way we see archaeology. It's opened up a whole window of opportunity where I think moving forward on future sites that you and I will definitely be looking at ways in which we can adopt some of the things we did at the Liberty of MOLA, um, particularly around engagement and uh, PR. Hi, my name is Sharon, I'm 17 and I live in London. So, um, I first came across archaeology through studying my A-levels. I take politics and in it we learn about the significance of the past heritage and of tradition, specifically in regards to the Conservative Party ideology and how that has played a dominant role in the political sphere now. 
Um, and in sociology, we learn about different cultures and across many different civilizations and how culture impacts the social world around them and their social norms. Um, archaeology also makes us realize how like important and relevant the past is, even in today's society. And I think that's quite important because today's society is essentially just a continuation of past societies. So what we deem to be acceptable or even deviant behavior is just an evolved version of what past societies have created. So by studying archaeology and understanding the cultural heritage that we all like have adopted, it helps us to understand civilization today. Um, archaeological research and archaeology broadly can just help um, help a community or even my community or any community by um, it can benefit them economically so it could bring in tourist attraction and that just has a ripple on effect to the, the, the community's high streets and like restaurants and things because people will then spend money on like food, drinks and the other cultural activities there which can then lead to the individuals in that society as having a sense of pride for their community because then that will lead to you know an increase in the well-being there so not only that um by having um archaeological findings we put in an, an exhibition for example um that can strengthen community engagement with the past and heritage and culture which can lead to like social sciences just broadly having greater value when traditionally you'll see um stem subjects as being seen as superior to social sciences so altogether archaeological research can benefit a community's values while also shaping their views on social sciences as well For me personally, um, archaeology can benefit me in the future because I aim to work in government as Secretary of State for Education. So I could potentially make archaeology a, a subject, um, um, yeah, a subject you could study at GCSE. And I could also use archaeological research and findings for my own sociological research, which I aim to do because I want to get a master's degree or potentially a PhD as well. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm uh, an early careers archaeologist and I'm the chairperson of the CIFA Early Careers Special Interest Group Committee. Um, I'd say that I first encountered archaeology uh, during my childhood on museum visits uh, and in school. Um, one thing that really sticks out to me um, is that I recently found a diary that I'd uh, written um, for a school project when I was in primary school um, about my summer holidays um, and I wrote about visiting Cheddar Gorge and you could see in what I'd written that I was really really amazed by this place and I was particularly amazed by Cheddar Man and how long he had uh, been preserved for and I think that might have sort of started my interest in archaeology. <laughs> um, I also remember I really, really enjoyed learning about the uh, ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans in uh, in primary school, um, to the point where I chose Latin so that I could study Roman history when I got to secondary school, <laughs> um, and ended up studying classics at A-level and then archaeology at university. Uh, so those sort of early experiences really uh, uh, really had uh, an impact on me. I think one of the main benefits of archaeology is really um, that we can understand more about our present by looking at the past. Yeah, I think one of the other benefits of archaeology is that people can learn about the areas that they're currently living in, uh, particularly with developer-led or commercial archaeology. Um, it often happens around where people are currently living, which gives you this great insight into the past and who lived where you currently live, which I think is amazing and really interesting. Um, I do also think that by looking at the past, we can um, actually become more accepting of other people and their differences and different cultural differences that um, might be surrounding us. Um, 
I think looking at the sort of diversity of Roman London in particular is, is a great way to do that. Um, and I really hope that that does have a positive impact on people. I am really keen to continue a career in archaeology. Um, so I have just done about a year and two months in commercial archaeology um, as of recording this video and as of the time of the conference. Um, and I'd, I'd really like to uh, continue working in archaeology. I think that one of the uh, really good things about archaeology and heritage as a career path is that there are sort of lots of different options with it. Um, so while I'm currently working in field work, there are a lot of uh, different job roles out there. Um, for example, a lot of the roles with uh, Council for British Archaeology aren't field work, field work roles. Um, so there is really something for everyone out there. I've encountered archaeology in a few different ways, but the earliest one that I can remember is through watching the television show Time Team back in the early 2000s. And then as a teenager, I became involved with the Young Archaeologist Club, and I also volunteered on a number of local excavations, which are run either by local volunteer groups or by charity organisations. I also encountered it in a more professional manner through work experience, which is with bodies such as the National Trust. And I'm currently an undergraduate archaeology student, so I'm also encountering it in that more institutional manner. Archaeology has had a really meaningful impact on my life. In the simplest sense, the field has been something I've been fascinated with for much of my life. And so I spent quite a long time learning about archaeology and just trying to engage with it wherever I can. One of the really important things I think archaeology does is that it offers a glimpse into the types of lives and all different stories that often don't get preserved otherwise. And I think having access to this variety of stories about people in the past has been really important to me. I think archaeology can be beneficial for a whole host of reasons. It encourages us to think critically about what we are seeing and why we might be seeing it that way. It also encourages us to look at things from a variety of different perspectives and I think that these are all great outlooks to have. It's also a very flexible field which I think can help in making it a more accessible and more interesting as there is usually something that people can do around a topic that they are interested in. I think that archaeology can really help in recognising how diverse our communities are and how there is so much value in that, because it shows us that all sorts of people have been doing all sorts of things throughout our history. But also, my current community is mostly made up of students, and so I think having this avenue to learn about archaeology can be so useful for its ability to make us think deeply about the evidence in front of us and critically think about it. I am hoping to continue studying archaeology as well as working within the sector. I would also like to continue volunteering both in a more traditional manner through excavations and processing of finds, but also in an outreach manner. Really good. Um, and again, I've got to say the same as Kate. Sorry if I repeat anything that you've heard already. I think it's been some really great sessions this morning and uh, already and I've already made like extra notes from my notes that I had for these slides <laughs> so bear with I'm a little bit unrehearsed and I'm incredibly nervous because holy crikey we all have feet what the heck <laughs> anybody else wear their dancing shoes just me no um so yeah bear with very nervous um but hi I'm going to tell you uh, about stream two which is on Friday um in this room I think this is Lansdowne mm -hmm. isn't it so yeah, please come. Um, I feel like mine's going to be a little bit drier than maybe somebody else's. Um, but I thought I would start not about telling you about Stream 2, um, but instead uh, telling you about this lady um, who is awesome. Um, and uh, Mostly this was my response to um, some things and thoughts and comments which came up while I was putting my session together. Um, that then became Stream 2. Um, and it seemed to be that a lot of people had um, concerns 
um, ab about the industry and where it's going and uh, kind of what could be done. And reflecting a little bit on what I've heard this morning, I maybe feel like some of those concerns might be reactions to change and evolution and maybe somebody mentioned you know, resistance to change and maybe that's where that concern is coming from. But anyway, um, some people seem to be a little concerned, a little fearful, um, a little worried. Um, and then this made me think about parallels with the climate crisis, uh, which a lot of people have also um, talked about this morning. Um, and then kind of what we can do to turn these feelings around. Um, so take a moment to talk about optimism. Okay, um, so this is Cristiana Pugueres. Uh, apologies if anyone is Spanish speaking and I've mispronounced that. Um, um, but she's famous for basically being awesome and amazing and a general all round badass, um, but also for banging her hand so hard on the table at COP15 um, that she bloodied her hands. And this was because uh, the other representatives would not let her speak, they would not give her room to let her voice be heard. Um, and generally COP15 was kind of viewed as an unmitigated failure. Um, but they achieved what they needed to achieve at uh, COP21 uh, in Paris, which then led to the Paris Agreement. Um, and now Christiana, she left COP15 feeling uh, quite defeated, quite down, um, disheartened, um, but knowing that she needed to do something. Um, and she needed to take a stand. Um, so what she did was adopt this view. Um, and I'll just read a quote for you. So optimism is a deliberate choice uh, that we have to make every day, almost every moment of every day. Uh, it's a deliberate choice to focus on the positive and harvest our internal conviction that there is enough potential within us and collectively um, to uh, make the changes that we want to see in the world. And she defines this as stubborn optimism. Um, so stubborn optimism is a responsible choice, a choice that we each make every single day um, and which requires us to be fully aware of the situation we see before us and not be blind to it. Um, and at the same time, we need to be filled with the conviction that we possess uh, the ingenuity, the innovation, the determination to change things for the better. I think hopefully we all have that. The fact that we're here means that we have that. Um, and then we can avoid this sort of fog of doom and gloom um, and focus on a sense of responsibility, of purpose, of accountability. And those are all words that I've heard people say this morning, um, which is really exciting. Um, and some people might call this hope, um, but I think it's, it's hope, but with an action plan. Um, and, and that's the key difference. Um, so, stream two, why and how we do archaeology and why we might add more value. Um, so I mentioned this feeling of concern about the future of the industry, um, maybe heritage more broadly and how we're defining that and what it means. Um, and this came up as I was talking to people and as I developed my original idea for the session. And what was interesting um, was that the session on Friday came into being because it was clear that other people from other organizations have been having the same conversations um, with people that they were in, who were in their circles. Um, and as a result, there were kind of three papers that came in that had quite close themes. They all seemed to relate to each other. And that's how Stream 2 came into being. Um, and in Stream 2, what we want to do is encourage discussion and questions, constructive challenge about the way forward in our industry. Um, you know, it's been highlighted that there are, a lot of, there are a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of thoughts, a lot of plans, a lot of directions, a lot of people doing a lot of research, um, a lot of voices to be heard. Uh, um, and, you know, it's kind of about making sure that we make space for everyone to have their voice heard. Um, and then we'll be talking about uh, where can we derive the most value from our work, or where can we find the most value in our work. Uh, so firstly, yes, this will be an audience participation session. Sorry, uh, Kate mentioned it, but it's going to be a slightly different structure. It is. Um, <laughs> and I'll get onto that in a minute. Um, but I, I think and I, I hope that we all care deeply enough um, about what we do, that we're going to overcome our innate dread of the words audience participation um, <laughs> and uh, come together for a meaningful and stubbornly optimistic uh, conversation about the future of our industry. 
So our plan for the session um, is that we want to accommodate everybody from across the industry. Um, so, you know, uh, academics, the museums, the LPAs, um, the contracting, the consultants. Um, and mostly this is because we didn't feel that we could look at this area without looking at it holistically. Um, I think we're probably not going to touch on things like tourism because I think it's more appropriate for stream one to talk about public value and tourism in that sphere. So we're probably going to focus more on, I guess, what we might term the professional. Um, although all these see Richard cringing at the use of professional. <laughs> um, so yes. And we have three big questions um, for the stream. These are, what value do we offer to others? And how can we ensure that they see our value? What value do we see in ourselves, in our profession? And how do we maximize um, our own value to enrich what we do? Um, and what can we do about it? Um, basically, what steps can we save? Um, but I can see you thinking, OK, well, fine, what does that mean? Um, so as described in the abstract for the stream, we're gonna, um, we, we often put a specific type of value on our work, uh, monetary. Um, and as we seek to justify the time and the cost uh, required for our works, um, the, the term monetary comes up again and again. And I might come back to that term justify uh, just in a minute. Uh, we'll be asking our panelists and our presenters, um, but also the attendees, and that's all of you, I hope, um, to talk about their experience in these areas uh, and to highlight what value means to them, what they think value means to their clients, or if you are a client, what value means to you um, and how, what you view that as with heritage, um, or maybe from others who view the industry from the outside. And you've heard some of those voices potentially just now. Um, is it true that they need us to justify our work? Or do they see us in intrinsically valuable? Do they, you know, do they automatically see our value? Um, I think one of the points which will also likely come up in the stream is this, um, what Kate mentioned, which is this uh, value versus benefit or public benefit. Um, I'm going to repeat Kate here because we often use them interchangeably. And I guess there's a question about um, whether we should use them interchangeably. Are they the same thing? Do we need clearer definitions in order to focus our work and make sure that we are delivering what we need to be delivering for the people who need it? Um, so it would be interesting to incorporate the views of those people who attend stream one into stream two as well. And obviously, if you can't make those, um, there's the Cadence platform, and we encourage you to use that to express your views to us, and we'll try and incorporate those into the session as best we can. So that leads us on to the second theme, which is why do we do this? Why do I do this? Um, I think that's a question we've often asked ourselves um, when we are elbow deep in somebody else's remains, or if we're listening to our roommate snore at 3 a.m. again. Um, but in this case, uh, we're looking to get what your views on what you think of your profession and where the value lies in your profession, um, as opposed to looking outwards. So we'd be looking inwards. Um, so what's the value of your work? Have you ever experienced an, an incident where someone has questioned the value of your work, um, either from internally or externally? Um, and then I think we want to gather those views and try and get a good understanding of the issues and have a talk about them and see if we can maybe make sure that we're being valued as the professionals that we are. Um, stream is essentially a discussion on how we can make our clients and those external to our industry and ourselves, um, well, give a shit. Um, essentially, it's one of my co-organizers coined it in their abstract originally. Uh, so it's, and it's also a call to those who have a plan. If you have a plan, come to our session. Or if you want a plan, come to the session. You know, it's been touched on that there are lots of people out there who are developing plans, who have ideas, and it's about making those connections um, and making sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so yeah, let's make that plan together. Um, and that's what the first part, and that's what the stream is about. Um, and I, yeah, I think my goal is for everyone to leave the conference with at least three things which they feel they can action um, in, uh, to improve the value or to maximize value. Um, yeah, time for a bit of stubborn optimism. Um, and it's time for a plan. You know, Pete had a call for action 
um, at the end of the session just this morning. And I think, you know, I hope that stream two is the answer to that call for action. So uh, I'm just going to, this is the day. I will try and whiz through this because it's actually pretty tedious. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've got a bit of intro, a bit of admin, a bit of setup, no icebreakers, I promise. I know I said audience involvement, but I won't go that far. Um, we then move on to first paper, which is provided by Karen Nixon, and it's the update on the um, Ciara? Syria. 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 Thank you. Uh, Syria guidance, um, which again, lots of you will probably be aware of, and if you're not, this is a really good opportunity to develop that awareness if you've not managed to make it to any of the other presentations which have been going on recently. Um, we do ask you to hold questions until the panel discussion and the Q&As, um, and then we'll just address everything. Um, either you can put those into the Cadence platform, or you can just jot them down, whatever you want to do. Um, so after the paper, we'll then set up for our first panel discussion, um, and uh, during that session we'll hear from six panellists, and they've got a range of experiences uh, from within and across the industry, and then we'll take, they will take a few minutes to discuss their views on the key topic, and then we will open the floor to questions, challenges, thoughts, discussion, and we that are uh, moderating the session will be making notes of those, obviously moderating cadence, we want this to be interactive um, if possible. Um, the second paper kind of follows the same format. Um, we have Chris and Kenneth uh, talking about um, jobs and careers and the future of the profession and uh, how we keep that sort of talent pipeline going, um, which hopefully should be really interesting. And again, we ask that you just hold the questions until the discussion. Uh, the format will be the same. Um, so then lunch, uh, which any bear of very small brain will tell you is important thinking time. Um, so, you know, please take it away, discuss it with your colleagues, you know, we want to keep it going and we, most importantly, we want you to come back in the afternoon. Come back and continue that discussion and the, 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 pa the last part of the day, everyone will be tired, but it is the most important um, to bring it together, to pull all these strands together and start making this, this plan, this action plan. And we'll highlight the themes and the questions and connections that could be made or will be made or have been made. Um, and there'll be another dis opportunity for discussion and challenges and hopefully then yeah, we'll get something really positive out of this and really constructive. Um, so that's that. And here we are, um, some stubborn optimists. Um, feel free to approach us if you see us around. Um, so we've got myself on the end there. My colleague Hayley James from HS2, uh, we've got Adam Fraser from Arcadis, Naomi Trop from Arcadis, Dan Evans from Arcadis, and uh, Jana Uat blake uh, also from Arcadis. Um, so again, please use the Cadence platform. We want it to be a really interactive session. We want you to be thinking all through the conference about what these challenges are, what these questions are, what you can bring to the session, and uh, we really want to get everyone geared up. And uh, yeah, we'll do our best to incorporate it. If you're not able to make the session on Friday, I know that some people will need to get away. Not everybody is able to attend for all three days. Um, but yeah, we want to hear from you. Um, you know, what is value? What does it mean to you? Uh, what can we offer? And that's me.